I am back up here to talk about something also motion preserving, but uh, from the uh, the other side of the other side of the body. And this has been asked to talk about interspinous and interlaminar devices, commonly asked questions. Um, and uh, I think we'll give this a go. So we're talking about a whole different set of patients right now. These are elderly patients with stenosis um, and with or without uh, spondylolisthesis. So the questions really to ask about these spacers is what is the role, what are the results, what's the difference between interlaminar and interspinous, the outcomes and complications. And interestingly enough, there's a fair amount about this stuff written in the literature and particularly in the European literature, which I was kind of surprised about. So, you know, where, where do they fit in the continuum of care for spinal stenosis? You know, decompression alone, if there's some instability, might not be stable enough. Um, if you use a, a device, maybe stable, maybe too much, you know. Uh, fusion, is that appropriate in certain cases? Absolutely. Is it overkill? In many circumstances, absolutely. Uh, and then, obviously, almost everybody uses instrumentation now for fusion. But at any rate, there are a, a tremendous amount of devices that have been developed. Uh, most of them are outside the U.S. Uh, there's really, right now, um, only two devices in the U.S. that are FDA, or there are three that are FDA approved and two that are currently marketed. The first one to market was the XDOP, and the more recent iteration uh, done through a tube, MIS, is the Superion. The interesting thing, and there's a misconception that the XDOP was taken off the market because it didn't work. Well, when you do the wrong indications, yes, that's true, it doesn't work. But it really was not a commercial success, and, and the ultimate purchaser of the XDOP, um, it didn't really fit with them. But um, there was data, and there were some, there were some good folks doing uh, studies on the XDOP. This is a ex, uh, UW guy, Paul Anderson, um, who published a series of XDOP versus non-op patients for uh, in neurogenic claudication and degenerative spondy. And you'll see when you look at all, at all the devices, whether it's interspinous or interlaminar, Almost all the studies are divided into stenosis without spondy and stenosis with spondy. And it, it really, in, in the way that I approach them now in my practice, I approach it quite differently. Um, this was a subset, I believe, of the IDE population. And we, we can talk about the study. That the XDOP was FDA, it was FDA approved in a way that nothing could get FDA approved right now. It was a low-powered study. And, and the interesting thing is, and if you read the papers, and particularly in as, you know, this one as well, against non-operative treatment. Basically, you're doing a study on a patient saying, we're going to randomize you, and you're either going to get something done or you're going to get nothing done. You know, so there's an inherent you know, bias of being in the study by a patient because, oh, I got something done. I you know, may be more prone to get better. But be that as it may, you know, everything has its time in, 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 in its time and place, and this was the way things were done back then. Um, not unexpectedly, the patients who had something done did better than the patients that had nothing done. Um, and essentially, uh, that's what the conclusion uh, of the study was. Um, patients were more satisfied, they had a higher success rate. So the authors concluded that the XDOP is more effective than non-op treatment in the management of neurogenic claudication stenosis with degenerative spondy. Um, this was the overall cohort. And, and, and again, look, look at the power of the study. You know, basically just under 200 patients. Um, but this lumped in both the patients with and without uh, spondy. Uh, and again, not surprisingly, the patients that had something done did better than the patients that had nothing done. Sounds really cynical, doesn't it? But we can do that in retrospect. Uh, this, is, this is what we're treating, and I'm not going to spend any time on the, on the clinical presentation because we're way beyond that. But then the Superion came out, and, and this was an, a really interesting device because it had really the same mechanism. I mean, it looked like a slimmed down X-Stop, but it was put through a tube, um, so it, it had kind of that MIS thing. Um, actually, it was, you know, the, the company... Um, has been sold since then, but the original company I was uh, a co-medical director of, so I know a lot about this study. I was intricately involved in this study. Um, and again, another digression, 
the study, we had a, something like 25 sites. Um, 22 of them were orthopedic and neurosurgery spine surgeons. Two or three were pain docs. This the study was successful. It got FDA approved, and this device now is 99% used by pain docs. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It just, it just was not able to be marketed to surgeons because of the, the kind of the, the poor taste in the mouth of XDOP, because most surgeons feel that it was a failure because it wasn't really used properly. Um, and, you know, you're, it, this, is, this is a very low reimbursing procedure for a condition we see all the time, which is stenosis with and without spondy, that we've got a treatment for, you know, hundreds of years, 100 years that, that works great. Um, so, you know, from a commercial standpoint, it's still around, but it's mostly in the pain sphere, which is why probably most of the people um, here on the Zoom really haven't heard much about it. Um, but they did a, a non-inferiority trial against the XDOP, which, which was the predicate FDA-approved device at the time. And is not surprisingly, it was a successful study uh, confirming the non-inferiority and was ultimately uh, FDA-approved. Um, th there really was not much difference between the, the spondies and the non-spondies. Both patients uh, did about as well. Um, the European literature was much less friendly to interspinous uh, devices. Um, this paper was a retrospective uh, study of, and, and again, it's, it's not a clean study, it's multiple devices. Um, you know, there, there's no way you can actually, I mean, you can tear the dura with an X stop, but you have to be really off your plane to do that. Um, spinous process factors are real. They're real with interlaminar devices, they're real with, with interspinous devices. It's, it's a complication. It doesn't necessarily affect the ultimate outcome, but it certainly you know, needs to be you know, monitored. So in this study, the author's conclusions were that, that it just was not a substitute for you know, the, the standard treatment. So let's move on to Coflex now, which is, which is a device used by a fair number of surgeons and has had some commercial success. Uh, in the U.S., and um, I, I personally use it in, in my practice um, for hopefully the right reasons. Uh, it's a, considered to be an interlaminar device, so it's not totally relying on the spinous process for fixation. You know, if you look at the device, the fins do hold on to the spinous process, so there is some spinous process fixation, but the U part of it um, in, in this device was, you know, uh, evolved from the, what's it called, the, what was the original? European it had another name. Dynamox? No. It, well, I'll think it had another name, um, but it had U in the name because it kind of looked like a U. Um, but it differentiates itself from a purely interspinous fixation. Um, it, it does uh, guard against extension, which helps uh, spinal stenosis patients. Theoretically reduces load on the facet joint and compresses an extension, and it actually is a, a dynamic device, a moving device. Um, this was uh, okay. So this study, two-year follow-up after decompressive surgery with and without inter, with a, without an interspinous device. This was a, uh, a a this wasn't the FDA study, but it was a look from. Uh, a prospective study without formal randomization, small cohort, um, and again, U European data was not very favorable to this class of devices. Um, another uh, study uh, for symptomatic uh, spinal stenosis uh, that actually showed that for stenosis without spondy, Coflex pa patients did improve more than the other, but then again, we don't know if there's any standardization of the type of decompression. To place a Coflex device, you have to do a fairly robust decompression. So you're decompressing more than you might otherwise do as a control patient in that study. Again, I'm not making any excuses. Um, so uh, this was the uh, IDE uh, trial. Um, decompression, uh, Coflex, decom uh, I'm sorry, let me go backwards. Um, this is a Cof Coflex in this study, and again, the trouble with, with these devices is what do you choose as a control for a good study? Should it be a decompression? Well, in this study, they compared Coflex, decompression and Coflex, 
to decompression and a standard postural lateral fusion, much bigger surgery, much more dissection, <coughs> longer rehab, et cetera. Um, and they did, you know, to their credit, follow these patients out for five years, and, and they fulfilled all the FDA requirements. And in fact, compared to decompression and posterior lateral fusion, no inner body, just standard posterior lateral fusion, um, the COFLEX device did perform favorably. Um, you know, the question is, for spinal stenosis without instability, do you need a fusion or a an inner laminar coflex type device, and in a lot of cases you don't. I will tell you that personally, I now use the coflex for just uh, patients with spondy that might otherwise be indicated for a fusion, and it's frankly it's less surgery and the failure rate's really quite low. Um, so you know, again, picking. The control, is, it's tough because you've picked a control that you know has a more prolonged recovery, higher infection rate, you know, pseudarthrosis, which you're not going to get with a non-fusion uh, uh, device. But, you know, the, the question also um, lends itself, again, and, and I know this was important to the, the company, again, before they sold, uh, was what about patients with stable stenosis? Does it help? back pain compared to a decompression alone, which probably would have been a better uh, control. And, and in fact, this, this European data um, was, was actually favorable and said that in a stable stenosis, in a patient with significant back pain, and they used the VAS above, I think it was four on a scale of 10 or 40 on a scale of 100, that the, the additional stability provided by the Colflex did appear to have uh, a benefit. So their conclusion um, was a safe and effective way to treat patients with lumbar stenosis and seems to generate, this was not the five-year study, this was a shorter study, short-term outcomes in patients um, with pronounced back pain and associated uh, spondy. Um, this was a, a cost analysis, and again, I, I don't know that it's really fair to compare the cost compared to a fusion, because fusions are just you know inherently more uh, they take more resources. So uh, the cost analysis was favorable uh, for uh, the COFLEX. Um, this was uh, the US IDE trial uh, comparing COFLEX with laminectomy and posterior fusion. And this was the subset with grade one spondy, which is, if there is a sweet spot, this is the sweet spot for the COFLEX. And, and this is what I personally use in, in patients to try to keep the older folks from, you know, from getting more invasive T lifts or X lifts or whatever alphabet soup people are doing uh, these days. Um, and in, in fact, um, the Coflex, not surprisingly, had less operative time, less blood loss, le less hospital stay. Patients, both sides did well. The, the success rate was similar. Uh, the re op in the short term was greater with the Coflex, um, but it was less surgery. Uh, and the fusion had, uh, uh, you know, obviously better deformity correction. So the author's conclusion was low-grade spondy can effectively be stabilized by Coflex with similar outcomes, better short-term perioperative outcomes, less adjacent segment, but higher re-op rates compared to fusion at two years. So in summary, the, the literature generally supports the use of interspinous interlaminar devices, again, in selected patients, and as, as we know, you know, we'll, as we learned with the, with the, the arthroplasty, the disc replacement, the closer you stay to, to the, the studied guidelines, the better results you're going to have. So you know, as mentioned, indications are the key. So appreciate your attention. And again, I thank uh, Jens for uh, hosting me up here. Thank you, Scott. It's a very comprehensive view of the literature. I asked a question to industry during the break, which is kind of uh, not fair. I'm going to ask you the same question. That is, I have a super active lady, it's actually a real life case, 57 year old yoga lady. She has that subtle grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis that's sliding about three and a half millimeters. The facet joints are congress, high grade stenosis. And she really does not want a fusion. The disc below is kind of shot. Uh, she needs a decompression. She can, without effort, put her hands to the floor. She's a yoga master. Is that the right patient for an interspinous spacer? And if so, uh, which one would you choose? So, so why is it a fair question to me? Okay, I'll answer. It, it is a fair question. So, one of the relative contraindications. So, 
the, the superior device, the interspinous device, is used without a decompression. So th that one's off the table with high-grade stenosis. So we'd be talking about the, the Coflex, which is used with a concomitant decompression. Um, one of the relative contraindications, and we, we use this when we talk about this in study groups, is a sloppy spondy. So in other words, someone who's moving, and, and, and there's not, and it's a, a subjective judgment, because there's not, if it moves more than two millimeters or less than two mil, I mean, you can make the x-ray say whatever you want. But a sloppy spondy has a higher rate of failure. Now, back to real world, I have the same patients. And I, I just say, you know, this is kind of this is kind of where you fit in the continuum. You know, most of medicine's gray zone. Your gray zone. The worst thing that happens is this thing pops out, and you either have return of symptoms or you don't. I mean, if it pops out, it goes away from the canal. It goes posteriorly. Um, and I have had very flexible patients, women. What exactly the type of patient you describe um, opt for it, and have had some successes and some that it didn't stay in place. So, I mean, I think that's where that whole shared decision making thing comes in. I don't, I don't, I don't think you know with you know proper kind of shared decision making, it's the wrong thing to do. I know you'll feel better if you had a stable construct, Jens, but she didn't want it. You haven't burned it. You haven't burnt that bridge. You can always do a fusion. That's a nice thing about this. You've already done your decompression, so you can actually do, you know, an, an MIS fusion that doesn't involve re-decompression if she does happen to um, fail. Right. Yeah. You know, Scott, yeah, it's Todd. I, I agree that, you know, I consider, and I use Coflex as well, I consider it a transitional device. You know, it's it's something that you don't have to go to the fusion yet. It does buy you time frequently. And then you can, uh, as long as you explain that to the patient, look, I'm trying to keep you mobile and active for as long as possible. And if we end up having to default to fusion, but there is this transition zone between decompression and fusion. And if you can keep them in that window, you keep the mobility. Yeah, and, and I think in a patient in their late 50s, you're absolutely right. It's going to be a transition kind of procedure. You know, if they're late 70s, early 80s, it can be definitive. I mean, they're not going to come back. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's the problem. Uh, we are also using the Coflex, and we have seen the this kind of patients, uh, Jens, that you are mentioning, is not a good uh, example for the Coflex because we have seen this is a kind of borderline case where you and and Scott has already said that uh, right. Uh, you have. As I would say, 50% will have a failure and 50% will work. That's the reason why we are using this kind of patient, because we can use that as 360 motion device. Now, there's, a, there's another device out there, this is what I was leading up to, that um, allows us to decompress, but it uses a flexible compression device, the Limiflex. I think the Europeans, the Germans, have used that far more than we have. Mm -hmm. We're part of the FDA trial, but conceptually, for this kind of a high active uh, patient, that would make more sense to me than a spreading device. What are your thoughts on that kind of a compressive dynamic fixation? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think Jack, we were not not Jack or me personally, but I think we had some of our guys in that study and did a did a few cases. I I haven't heard the results yet, but I think inherently that makes sense what you're saying. Rudy, did you use that kind of a Limiflex type compressive dynamic fixation device? Yeah, we we have used a, this poster device from it's an Israeli company actually, uh, and this works pretty well in this kind of patients too. But the key is that the disc has not to be damaged too much because you have a lot of stress onto the screws, mm -hmm. this problem. 